Okay, great. I have seen the numbers of people joining starting to slow down, so I will pick things off. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining. My name is Hannah Szczepanski and I'm from Mutual Ventures, and I'll be chairing today's conversation with colleagues from Achieving for Children. Thank you for joining us. Um, so just for a bit of context, this is the latest in our series of webinars as part of the Department for Education's Fostering Recruitment and Retention Programme. I think most of us uh, joining today will be part of that programme, but if you're from outside of uh, the programme, in short, this is about increasing the number of foster carers to provide more loving homes for our most vulnerable children. And a central focus of the programme is creating recruitment support hubs as a service across groups of local authorities to support foster carers' journey from initial inquiry through to uh, application. Uh, so a key part of this also is that the Recruitment Support Hub is a single point of contact for those inquiring to foster um, and will also be where uh, prospective foster carers can go for ongoing emotional and practical advice on the approval process. So I'm very pleased today to be joined uh, by colleagues from Achieving for Children. We have Matthew, Suzanne and Tom joining us. Um, who will be sharing insights from delivering services uh, across councils. So Achieving for Children is a local authority owned children's trust that manages children's services for three local authorities, the London boroughs of Kingston Council, Richmond Council and Windsor and Maidenhead Councils. Uh, today we'll be speaking about lessons they've learned in a range of areas, including regional buy-in, case management systems and data sharing as well, which will hopefully support local authority clusters preparing to implement their regional fostering recruitment hubs over the next few months. Um, as always, if you've got any questions, please feel free to pop these in the Q&A chat um, and we'll get to them. And we'll also be sharing a recording of this webinar for those colleagues that are unable to attend today. So great, now I'll turn to our panelists to introduce themselves. So we have Suzanne, Matthew and Tom, are you able to unmute and say hello? Yeah, morning, everyone. My name is Matthew Edwards. I'm the Associate Director for Provider Services at Children for Children, which means I oversee fostering children's homes and supported accommodation for young people. My name is Suzanne Payne. I'm the Associate Director for Strategy and Transformation, and I work across all three local um, boroughs. And my responsibility is, is kind of supporting the back office functions. So we look after business systems, data information, um, information governance, projects, communications and marketing. And good morning, everyone. I'm Tom Chapman. I'm Head of Business Systems and Strategic IT Lead for AFC. Um, my remit specifically focuses on the business systems that we use and the case management systems, making sure that they support uh, the services that we deliver across all, all three local authorities. Thanks, all. That's, that's really helpful and nice to have you today. So before we start talking about cross-council working and lessons that you might have for local authority clusters, um, it'd be really helpful if you could give us a bit of an introduction to Achieving for Children um, and a bit of context. Um, Suzanne, if I come to you, if that's OK, um, it'd be also yep. really helpful to hear if how Achieving for Children set up as a local authority owned children's trust will differ from recruitment support hubs, which will be hosted by a lead local authority on behalf of other local authorities in their cluster. OK, so AFC is a community interest company and not for profit social enterprise. And we were created in 2014 by Kingston and Richmond initially um, to provide the whole breadth of children's services. Um, so everything from youth services all the way through to um, fostering and leaving care and everything in between. In 2017, um, the Royal Bar of Windsor and Maidenhead joined as our third owner. And um, between us, we've, we've been delivering services for nearly 10 years now. So as I said, we deliver social care, education, health services um, to the children and young people across our boroughs. We have a fostering service that spans all three boroughs, which Matthew will talk about in more detail. And our mission is to provide children and families with the support and services they need to live happy, healthy and successful lives. So it's one of the unique features of Achieving for Children is that um, we do also deliver some paid services. So 
We do some consultancy and we are part of the DFE's improvement program supporting other local authorities. So there's a there's a slight kind of business angle to AFC as much as delivering children's social care and other services. Um, so we're set up as a separate company. So we're registered with Companies House. Um, we have a management board. We're obligated to provide annual reports on our company status. And I suppose this is kind of what differs to um, the regional um, arrangements. So we have um, data sharing agreements, which um, are slightly different, I think, to the recruitment support hubs, for example. So since we're one organization, um, information kind of is part and parcel of what we do, um, which I think will be different if you've got, for example, a host authority on behalf of your region. So in data protection terminology, AFC is its own data controller, which means it determines the purposes and means of processing information. Um, but as with host authorities, we're obligated to meet all those data protection responsibilities. But I'll, I'll talk a little bit later about that. So I would say probably it's slightly easier for achieving for children to share information. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not at all possible. And I think we've got lots of experience around how we can share information, um, particularly across other partners. Thanks, Suzanne. That's that's really helpful uh, context. So uh, to start us off, then, um, it'd be great to hear about the main lessons from cross council working in children's services. So if we start with the positives, um, if I start with you, Matthew, and then I can come to Suzanne and Tom, if they've got anything to add. Sure. Um, start off. Lots, lots of positives, I'm glad to say. So um, do you feel that each local authority wants an, an evidence base that any changes they're going to make in practice are going to be efficient, effective and value for money. And working across three local authorities, I think has enabled Achieving for Children to take good practice from one authority area and embed it in others um, much more easily. So in fostering, working across three local authorities, we've been able to standardize our practice and policy. Um, we've got one fostering handbook, we've developed one fostering association, we've created an on-call service which is more responsive out of hours, um, we've improved our training offer to carers and we've created more peer mentoring. Um, I think being across three authorities does allow you some license to innovate. And one specific example, which I think all the people on the call that are fostering specialists will know about, is where, where we're looking to grow our pool of kinship carers because there are not enough mainstream carers to provide all children with a local placement and so um, in uh, Achievement for Children, one of our fostering teams took over all the viability assessments of potential kinship carers from the so frontline social work teams, as there was a real issue um, with consistency and the quality of those assessments. And we immediately found that there were huge benefits in the fostering service actually picking up the viability work earlier. Um, the worker who conducted the viability would often stay on and complete the full kinship assessment which made a huge difference to the families in terms of the continuity of advice and support they were getting. So having done this in one area, it's been much easier to convince the other two local authorities areas to, to buy into this. And our fostering service is now gradually assuming responsibility for developing family network meetings and family group conferencing. So as well as trying to recruit mainstream carers, we've also become a targeted family matching service where we're helping families identify alternative carers earlier so that they're not conducting multiple connected person assessments at the direction of the courts. Um, as we move in, into a more regionalised approach, there are opportunities to raise the practice bar for all local authorities um, in that subcluster. And I don't think it'll be a case of dragging the higher performing authorities down. Uh, regionalised fostering will provide us with areas to share good practice and collaborate on top of the recruitment of mainstream carers and further develop the Mockingbird model. Um, as well as uh, looking at our work around assessment and support of kinship care, one area that's already come out, I think, is the development of supported lodging schemes for 16 years plus, which we may be able to do better in a combined way across several authorities than working on our own. Um, I do believe that um, working across authorities gives authorities that chance to share practice 
on also how we involve carers in running our services, how we capture the child and young person's voices and their lived experience in what we do. And there will always be byproducts when we work together and step away from that more parochial insular approach. So certainly we found that bringing three smaller services together has had involved a lot of aligning work, but now has got considerable benefits. We've, uh, in Achievement for Children, we've got Richmond and Kingston children placed in Windsor and Maidenhead and vice versa. That's given us more placement choice. It's given us better matching. It's given us more carers to help us manage peaks in demand. Um, and I would really imagine that as we develop the, um, the clusters, as our relationships and our trust grows, there may be opportunities for some sort of reciprocal fostering arrangements to support one another. Um, we also can hold on to special ex specialist expertise like recruit fostering recruitment officers, which might become lost or unaffordable if we were just being small single local authorities working on our own. Um, we have a number of key staff in the team for children that work across all three authority areas, including our recruitment officers, our panel advisors, our placement matching leads and our managers. And that does create a sort of a seamless organisation, even though we're serving three different authorities. There are, of course, more people to persuade when you work across a number of local authorities, but there are more children and families positively impacted. And I think that's why we all came in to do this job in the first place. Thanks, Matthew. That's that's really helpful and touched on a lot of different um, strengths there and benefits of a, a cross-council approach. Suzanne and Tom, do you have anything to add before we move on to the challenges, which Matthew has touched on some of them already? Yeah, um, I think it's just also to say we're able to join up resources in the back office. So we just need one approach to managing a wide range of things. So if you need, you know, your business systems, for example, then, you know, you can have one or, you know, all your um, policies around information governance. We've just got one, our project planning and communications and I think being in AFC also gives us um, greater purchasing power um, and it enables us to avoid kind of duplicating um, efforts. Um, and then we can share our learning across our operational areas and our collective brain power to solve problems. So there's there's definitely some some real benefits. Yeah, and I think I'd, I'd agree with that, that the working across local authorities gives us a certain economy of scale um, so we can we do have greater purchasing power, have greater influence with some of our system providers, uh, and that then gives us the opportunity to innovate to a certain extent with, with some of the case management systems that we use. So um, having that, that collective strength by being more than one local authority, I think is, is really, really useful from a, a systems perspective. Thank, thanks, Tom and, Tom and Suzanne. So Matthew, moving on to the challenges then, you've touched on some of those already. Um, but it'd be great to hear more about the key challenges of working across council and particularly how those can be mitigated as well. Yeah, so one of the key challenges is just more meetings. Um, if people are worried about their meeting load, often we have to go to three different meetings with three local authorities. So you've got more DCSs to talk to, more corporate parenting panels, more councillors, more lead members to win over, um, and an awful lot of Ofsted inspection. Um, so that keeps us busy. Um, so, but in terms of, um, I suppose, how we deal with change management, I've always believed that there is that, that process of engaging the willing and leading the unwilling. And if we can find ways to do that across the three councils, that does mitigate some of those challenges. Um, I've seen it in, in my practice as really about identifying who are your champions and who are your potential blockers um, in any form of change management. And you have to give your champions enough evidence that the changes are being effective in order for them to, to go out and sort of effectively silence the blockers and persuade the blockers that uh, moving forward is the right option. Um, and I, I'd also say that you can sort of mitigate things by trying to go ahead with more incremental uh, and organic change rather than to go for massive service restructure um, with all the he HR headaches that that can bring. Um, I'd really recommend people to call change a pilot, do it on a small scale for 12 months, embed it in your practice. Sometimes those around you are so busy, they won't even notice that you've made those changes incrementally. And you can do things under, under the ra radar. 
Um, so yeah, I would certainly say that that's one way to, to, to mitigate um, the challenges of it. Um, with fostering recruitment, I think we're all aware there aren't any silver bullets out there. There's no great, great one insight that will transform practice in any local authority in terms of recruiting carers. If every sort of corporate parenting panel I've ever been to, um, people have had very different sort of solutions to the crisis and recruiting foster carers. For some, it's social media we've got to use. For some, it's a, a physical presence in shopping centres. For others, it's carers recruiting carers. For others, it's having a, a really wide range of council perks, like reducing council tax and gym membership. I suppose in some ways it's got to be all of that, but it's it's about those, I suppose, the systemic changes that are incremental that will make our service better. Um, so how we've done that with local authorities is that we start with where the council's practice is already good and um, effectively not start with a deficit model, but we look on how they can incrementally build on what they're doing well. And with the three authorities, we've been able to pick up maybe where one authority is, is outperforming another, and then they'll be more a, a sort of eager and ready to listen to, to what changes they could potentially put in. Um, but I do feel that if you can get a local authority to really see and prize its strengths, um, then you're in a much better place where they might be open to learning and developing and listening to what another authority is doing and they won't be polarised and insular in their approaches. Um, so I do think we need to present this regionalisation programme as an opportunity to build on what's already being done well, um, but also that it should be bringing in some very specialist knowledge and practice across our regions. Thank you, Matthew. That's 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 really helpful. And just picking up on the point about buy-in, and you mentioned there identifying your your champions and your blockers. Are you able to say a bit more about how you've managed to do that in as a team for children? I think I think in the next area, in terms of my tips for buy-in, I'm going to sort of cover what I think is a, a process, uh, Hannah, that we we went through. So I'm happy if the others, if you want to ask the others those next questions, and I'll I'll cover that a little bit in okay. the in the next bit, which is taking us through what we did. That's really helpful, Suzanne and Tom. Any any challenges to highlight? Um, I think. You have to work in a collaborative way and sometimes this can be difficult if you've got different priorities or drivers so sometimes things can take longer to resolve or agree on so you have to navigate your way around that and build in extra time to make sure all the different partners are involved and are happy um, but sometimes you do have to take a bit more of a pragmatic approach to get things over the line so <sighs> Yeah, maybe there's more compromise than you might have normally. Um, but, you know, mitigations, as, mo as with most things, are to develop really good relationships and take time to invest in them. So I've found that you can achieve so much more when, you, when you've got that, when you've spent time understanding what people's motivations are, what they want to achieve, um, then, you know, you can, you can move forward quite quickly. I think we're quite lucky in AFC in that our demographic, graphics and politics are quite similar so that helps smooth the pathway so I think it's probably worthwhile investing in finding out what's important to each of your um, regional partners and understanding what's their motivate what their motivations are and and what they want to achieve from it because that helps you all come together then thanks Suzanne I think I'll just um, echo the fact that by having three separate local authority owners effectively we, we we do have multiple parties that we have to keep happy for for different areas so three different it services three different information governance services but as suzanne mentioned by developing strong relationships with them you can speed along some of that work as well you understand what their expectations are you understand that that minimum threshold that any solution needs to meet um but it can be complicated when you've got multiple parties to deal with and multiple meetings of, of the same meeting very often so Thanks. I think that set Matthew up nicely to talk about his his tips for buy-in then. Yeah, and obviously, yes, working on our our, our blockers to make them champions, as, as it were, which we'll, we'll now come on to. So I think in my experience, local authorities can be very introspective places. 
But I think things like the challenge around placements and budgets and, you know, all the 118 notices we're seeing has made DCSs and others start looking over their shoulder to look for where, where it could be better and more efficient practice. And, and mainly, I think, to look for where can we collaborate and, and work together because um, doing the same isn't going to get us out of some of the financial challenges that we're in with, with placements. Um, so uh, I suppose my tips for, for buy-in in terms of a, a process of change would be these. First of all, you've got to have a really clear and succinct overall vision of, of what you want um, in your particular local authority area. It's like having a flag that, that everyone can rally around. In a previous authority I worked in, we, our flag was, we called it riskiest, closest. And and risk it, and, and we we basically you know said that we will um, set out to keep our most risky and our most vulnerable children as close to home as we possibly can. And it was it was sort of pithy, and people could get their heads around it, and people could follow it as a, a, as a vision of what we wanted to do. And it also led to us you know obviously getting resources in terms of fostering and children's homes and supported accommodation for young people um, because they bought into our vision. Um, Secondly, is, is around engaging our, our children in care and our, our key care leavers in a, in a powerful and a meaningful way. No tokenism here, but absolutely making sure that the voices of our children in care and care leavers are informing and backing that direction of travel and um, that they should be driving your corporate parenting panels. We, we had a corporate parenting panel in Kingston last week where we had more children in care and care leavers than we had officers. And I thought that's a step in the right direction rather than having a panel full of adults and a couple of children. Um, so if those young voices can be leading the vision, it becomes very hard for others to block. Um, that they are such natural advocates for change and because they've been in the system, um, they're absolutely key champions. So any change management uh, must involve using their voices. And then next, I suppose I, I talk through how we must engage our foster carers themselves in, in shaping that direction of travel. I know that the recruitment uh, project is, is looking very much into that. What can we learn? Our foster carers are absolute experts, both on recruitment and on retention, because they're in living and breathing that process. Um, so we may need to make sure that we have foster carers on our governance, in our boards, in setting the direction of travel. Watch out, though, because sometimes what you do is you get a clique of veteran carers that have been in councils for 20 or 30 years and they hold the reins. Of, of that association. And I think what we're trying to do, certainly across our three authorities, is, is give a greater balance to people like connected person carers, respite carers, specialist carers. Don't just have the voice of a few few on that group. Make sure it's fully representative of that wider group of carers, especially if there's a cohort of, of young people that you're unable to meet, then you've got to look, it might be parent and child foster carers or whatever, make sure you've got the voice of those existing people that are doing that role um, as, as champions, driving it forward. Um, then it's around the political side of, of making sure your leader and other key councillors are not only briefed, but feel that they are part taking that active part in shaping the direction of travel. Travel, um, They are key champions, but you will sometimes encounter councillors with a different brief who might be blockers. They might be covering finance or property, and you're going to have to work around them to release assets and resources into your placement strategy. Um, I said earlier, and I, I'd say this again, you've got to start by establishing what the local authority already does well. Strength-based approaches work with councils as well as they do with families. So we always try and talk to the councils first about what are their unique selling points? What, what's good about the council? What do they do well? And then we look to identify potential gaps in practice and use the other two authorities as examples of where practice could be sharpened and improved. Um, then I'd say, and I've nearly done, um, that your placement strategy um, has to be a live and active document, not just something you write for, for a three to five year plan and then stick on a shelf and ignore. It's got to have a, a living, breathing impact on your council's direction of travel. So it needs to be known and aware of in some of the transformation boards that your council 
uh, is engaging in um, so that um, it is clear about what the priorities are and the councillors are aware that doing nothing is not a solution at, at this point to this crisis, that we need to be proactive and be making changes. One of the things that we've tried to do is make sure everyone in the council is absolutely fully briefed about the costs of in-house versus external provision and that they are suitably alarmed that that gap is widening you know, extensively at the moment. So I'm aware that in our own authorities, about um, three to five years ago, I think the difference between an in-house foster placement and an external IFA placement was around £250 a week. Um, that's now up at something that, that, that effectively it's, uh, the IFA is 350 to 400 pounds a week more expensive. So um, that's, you know, suggests to me something of the scale of the challenge. Uh, for those of you working in residential uh, settings, um, our residential home with three, three children is still quite expensive. It costs 4,300 pounds a week. But two of those children um, came from placements which were costing us over 10,000 pounds a week. Um, so because the councillors, because the, the, the executives are aware of those discrepancies between the, those costings, we are being green lighted to develop our own provision as well as stronger commissioning arrangements across the local authorities. Um, and it has to be, I think, that sort of uh, two-pronged two approach so that we're not the, at the mercy of the market. And then I would um, encourage us all to make sure we've got project managers who can write robust business cases because however good your ideas are if your sums don't add up you'll be not making any progress um, so um, I still uh, must admit I, I struggle to understand things like net present value when looking at capital costs and I look at a budget sheet like Boris looks at a graph um, but I do have project managers around me and finance people who help me with that process so it is always a collaboration between those that sort of share the vision around the practice and those that back it up with firm finance and data. Um, peer reviews, I think, are a really critical area for us to, to learn how to collaborate, to break that parochial approach in an unthreatening way for authorities. So I'd really encourage you to make sure that you have got peer reviews going on with neighbouring authorities or authorities that are statistical neighbours so that you can listen and learn. Um, and then I would just make a real plea to use the national guidance to your advantage. Um, the Competition and Markets Authority review into children's social care and the government's response in terms of stable homes built on love provide us with an absolutely unique opportunity to drive practice forward at this time it's not always that you get 27 million pounds ready to be invested in fostering recruitment and retention. Um, so we use the, so the, the national changes to drive forward change locally. Um, one area that we've benefited from and others might be doing this too is, is using the, the Ofsted a registration of 16 plus provision to, to get heavy capital investment in some very tired and rundown buildings because those buildings need to now be Ofsted ready for inspection next year. I've spent five years trying to get improvements in, in those buildings, but because there's an Ofsted inspection coming, that's created the sort of the momentum to, to move things forward. So there is this unique opportunity with, these, with, with this, uh, this recruitment and retention, and we just want to, I think, grasp it uh, with both hands and not let some of that insularity and parochial approach block us from doing something really good. So um, yeah, I just think those are all the areas. I think um, as we sort of link with other authorities, I think there is a sense that you have to build up collaboration, you have to build up trust and shared objectives. There will be fear there about people losing fostering foster carers and fear that other authorities may try and poach carers. So I, I do recognize that there's a lot of work there that we're gonna need to do to build up trust but that shouldn't stop us, I think, from going on that journey. Thanks, Matthew. And I think there's there's a lot of kind of longer term aspirations there and also practical, helpful tips for having those conversations to start to build those relationships and trust. Um, great. So if we now turn our attention to data sharing and I'm going to direct some questions to our data expert on the call, who is Suzanne. Um, 
So if we can start off with how the Achievement for Children facilitate effective data sharing across the three councils, that would be really helpful. Yeah, of course. Um, so I said at the top of the meeting, it's uh, AFC is slightly different because it's its own company. So um, its governance arrangements help us with this challenge. We're one organisation and one data controller. Um, but um, even within that, we kind of help um, facilitate that by um, doing our best only to share information that we have to, even within that separate component organisation. So that limits our requirements for data processing um, set, set out in GDPR. Um, where we do share information outside of AFC, which we do regularly, so with partners, for example, we have clear data share, sharing agreements setting out how that information will be shared. So the data sharing agreement set out the purpose of the data sharing. It covers what happens to the data each stage. It sets the standards and it helps all the parties involved in sharing be clear about their roles and responsibilities. Um, having a data sharing agreement in place helps you to demonstrate that you're meeting your accountability obligations under the UK GDPR, um, which is you know, es essential in any kind of data sharing management. Um, so there's kind of a, a few components to that that are worth kind of me highlighting. So the data sharing agreement helps to set out what you share, that that information is accurate, that it follows an agreed format or standard. So um, that's really important when you want to come and analyze that information or report that information later that you've got information in the same style format, for example. Um, it considers all of the retention and deletion of shared information. So you don't want to be holding on to this information forever. There's, there's you know, timescales in which um, you need to record um, information for when it needs to go. Um, how that information is to be shared and what the data breach arrangements are. Um, the training of staff, using information and they so they understand their responsibilities how you deal with requests for information from the public including subject access requests and any complaints um, how you will review the data sharing agreement because it's or it's not always going to be the same you need to make sure that you adapt to things that are happening changes in policy maybe a partner's left the group so you always need to be quite agile um, in relation to that and then any termination of the agreement and then how you delete any shared data. So um, there's a responsibility after you've been working together to make sure all of that information is, is clear. Um, so we're also always really, really clear with our clients about how information will be used. And we do this by setting out a number of privacy notices um, I'm sure you'll all be familiar with a privacy notice. Um, and it's really just a way to make sure that um, the people we're working with absolutely know how their information is being processed, who it will be shared with, how we take care of it. And it means that, they're, um, that we cover off our obligations by um, UK data protection law as well. And usually these data privacy notices need to be in a public place. So we put them on our website, um, but we also publish them in other documents and correspondence that we, we send um, to, to clients when they start working with us. Um, what's helpful for us is we also have um, a separate information governance team and a data protection officer, and they oversee all of ASC's responsibilities for data protection, and making sure we're compliant. Um, in your regional arrangements, I'm sure you will have your uh, constituent data protection officers, um, but um, that's probably something you want to be thinking about um, when you come to, to looking at data um, protection activities. Thanks. Thanks, Suzanne. I, I, unless there's anything else on data privacy, which I think you've, you've covered off already, but unless there's anything to add, it'd be really helpful to kind of hear what you think local authority clusters need to be thinking about kind of in the next couple of months as they are working to um, set up their regional support hub? Yeah, um, I would just say one little extra thing. Um, there's um, something called a data protection impact assessment. And 
um, I would recommend that everybody undertakes one of these before any new project or um, piece of work. And it's just a way really of making sure that you understand what the data protection risks are before embarking on a piece of work. So as part of all of this, I think um, completing a data impact assessment is a really good tool to help you understand what you need to do and um, who you need to get involved, what you need to um, agree in advance before you um, embark on the kind of effort, I suppose, of um, establishing data sharing arrangements. But um, just in terms of kind of what uh, local authorities need to think about in terms of data sharing, the first top tip I'd say is you need to involve your data protection officer and you need to do that from an early stage. So they will help you make sure that you're meeting your legal obligations and requirements. Um, they know the law and how it applies to your particular setting. So um, get them involved and maybe they might need to have a separate partnership group um, with all the different regions as well. I think um, a partnership agreement would be really good. I think some of you have already done this um, and this should set out the terms of your engagement with each other. And that will sort of help build the bones, if you like, around any data sharing arrangements. I mentioned before about completing the data protection impact assessment. Um, so again, uh, something that you should, should undertake before embarking on um, your regional work. You should be thinking about how your hub will work. So will this be managed by a host authority? If it is, then the host authority will bear the responsibility of making sure the data protection principles are adhered to as the processor of that information. So they would need to make sure that they're meeting the information rights of the clients. Um, and that's probably something in addition to being the host that you need to consider. Um, the processes for managing the hub will need to be managed. So will the hub just record contact details or will a team complete an initial assessment? Whatever the processes are, you need to complete a workflow to make sure that these are considered as part of the data protection impact assessment. So you understand what the implications are. So if you are going out to do an initial assessment, there's much more access to personal and sensitive information available and therefore the data responsibilities are, are bigger and how you look after that information, store it, keep it accurate, how you share it um, becomes much more important. Um, the data uh, impact assessment also needs to be considered for any case management systems and Tom will talk a bit about that later but um, how your information be stored, what's the retention period, what security measures are in place, how you ensure accuracy. And then once you're happy with how the function would operate, you need to develop the data sharing agreements necessary to understand responsibilities and accountability. Um, you need the privacy notice, and you need to make sure that the policies and procedures are in place. So clients and data subjects know how they can implement their data rights. So if um, somebody wants to um, change their information, you need to have a process to know how to do that. If they want to have access to their information through a subject access request, you need to obl oblige um, them by doing that within the timescales that the information commissioner officer has given um, all organisations. So there's rights and responsibilities that all clients um, have and the regional group need to think how you'll meet those. Um, you should also consider how we share information back to the children, young people and families we're engaged in. So once we've collected that information, how do we then feed back to them? Um, and then finally, I would just say, just need to make sure you've understood there needs to be some capacity to manage all these different processes. Um, managing information, unfortunately, can be quite time consuming. So don't underestimate how much time that potentially might take um, and build that into your organisational structure when you, you start working through this. That's a very whistle top stop tour. <laughs> no, whistle stop tour, but, but a really helpful summary. And I'm, I'm, I hope other people find it useful as well. I think that's 
that's really helpful. Um, so last but not least, Tom, we've got some questions on case management systems, um, if that's OK. So what's Achieving for Children's approach to case management firstly? And it'd be helpful to hear a little bit about how you reached that approach as three councils. Sure. So um, since AFC's inception, uh, we've always sought to sort of align and consolidate systems wherever we possibly can. Now, that's easier said than done. Uh, so when AFC was formed back in 2014, the systems that we inherited from our, our two owning councils at the time, Richmond and Kingston, uh, if you could have had different systems, there were different systems. Uh, if you could have different ways of working, there were different ways of working. So we quickly found out it wasn't as simple as, as us as a system team just going, this is the system you should use and, and off you go. Um, the only real way to successfully consolidate and align systems is to align those working practices and processes. Uh, the case management systems are there to support service delivery and practice. They're not there to dictate it and control how, um, how services should work. So we found that the vast majority of the work that, that we do as a business systems team is our analysts are working with services to understand how they work, what are their processes, how can we align them, how can we improve them, um, and then translate that into how a case management system would work to support them. What you can't ever have, and I, I feel quite strongly about this, is the system should never dictate the practice. Um, we've seen it in the past where a system's implemented and IT say this is how it works, therefore that's how you have to work as a service. That's the wrong way around. Um, so it needs to be driven by the service and what their requirements are when you de develop that case management system. Um, I think this is a real key point for the clusters, actually. You're going to need to work with some support to develop your case management system, whether that be an internal business systems or IT team or external partner. It's absolutely critical that they understand your business and how you work. Uh, you need the person that's helping you to build that solution to understand as much about your work as it is the tech that's going to support it. So, so that's a real key thing. Uh, experience has also shown us that in order to successfully consolidate systems, you need to keep things as simple as possible, as I think has been touched on um, on a couple of points earlier, that the, the more widely you share things, the more parties you need to use the system, kind of the simpler you need to keep it, really. Uh, there is inevitably going to be some compromise on what the system can do. The more people that need to use it, the simpler it needs to be. Uh, but that is also a benefit in developing and getting a system spun up as quickly as you possibly can. The simpler you can possibly keep it, the better. And that's a, a brief summary of the, the, the approach that we've taken towards our, our case management sort of selection and, and usage. That, thanks, Tom. Um, and you started to talk about that it, there in terms of kind of keeping it simple and making sure that the system doesn't dictate practice. Are there any other key considerations for clusters when they're looking to set up their case management system? Sure. I mean, that, that, that is the first one, really. It, it's keep it simple and iterate. Um, when you are working as a group, you need to work out what is the bare minimum that we would need right now. And it's great to have conversations about wouldn't it be great if we could do this later? And in the future, we would like it to do this. Uh, but you need to be clear on what is the bare minimum we need to get this thing done and live and up and running. Now, this could be challenging, reining people in, uh, but, but that's what you're going to need to do as a group. What is the bare minimum that we really need? And that enables you to sort of start simple and iterate. So I'm aware of the time pressures that clusters have got. Uh, there will be multiple IT teams that need to be kept happy and information governance teams and local processes so the simpler you keep it, the better and the easier you will be able to get through that journey. Um, when you're doing your requirements and you're keeping it simple, it might actually look like a really, really short list. And you might think, hang on, have we undersold this a little bit here? But really focusing on doing the basics really, really well and then having a system that you can build on and iterate and keep developing. Uh, that iterative process as well will help you in so much as you won't know how some of these processes are going to work until you start doing them. There's going to be an element of uh, let, let's find out as we go along with it. By taking an iterative, iterative approach, you can build in those processes into future versions of the system rather than thinking, oh, this is how we reckon it's going to work before you start developing it. Uh, another key point, and this was mentioned, as Suzanne mentioned, this is engage your IT colleagues as soon as you possibly can. So local authority IT teams, as everyone will be aware, can sometimes work slower than you would expect. Uh, sometimes there's good reasons for this, other times maybe not so good reasons, but get them on board really, really early. 
because they will be able to spot if there's any significant hurdles or issues with any potential solution that you're looking to develop. Um, if you don't get them on board early, then it's going to be extra work and they're going to appear to be a blocker a little bit further down the line when they go off and, and do the necessary assurance that they need to do in order to, to make sure that the system that you've got is safe, appropriate and usable. Um, it's also critical for them to understand what it is that you're trying to achieve. Um, if they don't already have a good working knowledge of children's services, it's your job to make sure that your IT delivery partner understands what the benefits are. Why is this going to improve things for children, young people and family, what we're trying to achieve? Because by them understanding the broader picture and why it is that we're trying to do this, you will have them on site and, and they will do what you need them to do when, when you need them to do it. Uh, so that I think that's a really important point. And then the last thing that I touch on is security. Keep this in mind at every stage. We, we have a, a legal and a professional responsibility to keep this data safe and secure that we're collecting. So at all times think, do I really need to collect this? How can I minimize the, the data that I'm collecting? And how are we going to keep it secure? Your IT colleagues should be the ones taking responsibility for giving that technical assurance that the data is kept secure, um, but, but do consider it at all stages. And then I guess the final point is accessibility. So this is a system that's going to be used across local authority borders and, and, and with a wide number of partners, make sure that it isn't tied to any individual local authorities IT setup. So you need to be thinking of something that's web-based, secure and accessible from anywhere with an internet connection. The last thing you want is to be driven through a, an individual local authorities IT setup and, and process uh, because that will create a bottleneck that, that no one will thank you for. So I guess to summarise, Really keep it simple, both in your initial ambition and design of the systems. Engage your IT colleagues now, get them on board if they aren't already, and keep security and accessibility in mind. Thanks, Tom. Um, I think we've spoken about so many different topics in, in the last 50 minutes, which I think is reflective of all the inf insights that um, Achieving for Children have to share. And I think it's been particularly helpful to hear um, Kind of first-hand experience and examples of, of how it's worked um, when working across your three different councils. So I'm going to bring us to a close at this point, um, but it's been been really helpful to hear from you today. Um, and if anyone has any follow-up questions that we can pass on, please do get in touch as, um, yeah, I think there's been, a, there's been a lot that we've been speaking about. Um, finally, just to say a thank you again to our panellists, Matthew, Suzanne and Tom, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar.